Okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sergio Martinez, and I'm just a history nerd, history buff. I'm not a, um, a professor or historian, anything like that. I just do this, like most of, many of you, um, as a hobby, as a personal interest. And, um, and one of the areas that I really like to uh, focus in is arms and armor, uh, particularly in the ancient times as well as the high medieval periods. And today we'll be discussing the arms and armor uh, around the 14th and 15th century, um, particularly around the Hundred Years' War, as this is an area where a lot of the armor took uh, a significant change. Uh, it was a big transitional period where we'll see um, the simple armor from the Dark Age period, the uh, 5th, 6th, and 7th century, turn into the more plate and articulate armor as we um, we all are, we all recognize when we think of like knights and men in arms and stuff like that. So, um, as always, if anybody has questions or want to add to anything, feel free. Um, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions to the best of my capability. All right, so let's begin. So the thing about the armor around this period, a lot of it um, doesn't survive. You know, the best way to understand the functionality uh, and the construction of, of anything, uh, specifically armor and weaponry, is to see it in person if you have. And um, a lot of the, the pieces um, from this period, as I said, are, are not really available uh, for different reasons. Uh, so when we go to museums such as the, the British Museum, in London or the Metropolitan Museum uh, of Art in New York. And while they have a very extensive collection, uh, perhaps one of the best collections of armor, most of the armor from that period is from the mid to late 16th century, um, particularly like toward the end of the, the medieval period, if you will. Uh, I know a lot of people, when they think of the, the medieval knight, which is such a, uh, a romantic image, uh, they think of an individual that's um, covered in this phenomenal plate armor that well fit into uh, to his body and articulates and he wears a, a really nice helmet with a visor that goes up uh, with perhaps a, a feather plume such as the, the the image that I'm showing here uh, which is in action the arms and armor wing of Atomet. Uh, but in all reality the the knights or knighthood um, is pretty much phased out at the point uh, when this armor is being made and worn. So these individuals wouldn't necessarily be knights. Um, they perhaps would have been uh, men in arms or just professional soldiers that uh, competed in tournaments and so on and so forth. So the knight that we think about as far as uh, the title of the knight, um, which is in, just to give you a broad aspect, is just an individual that is given um, land by a lord or a king when exchanged his loyalty. He will fight for that um, that king or that lord um, when needed. Um, with this land, he could then um, rent it out to the peasants. Uh, and in exchange, he will now have um, wealth uh, due to this. Uh, but with that wealth, he now has to invest it in, um, in the latest arms and armor, weapons, a war horse, and of course he has to be a, a skilled trained uh, fighter, a, a warrior if you will. So um, that is in broad sense is what a knight is. But at this point, a lot of the, the, the armor that was worn by, by the, um, the knights in this uh, period, which is 12th, 13th, 14th, and maybe a little bit in the early 15th century is, is really hard to find. So um, to understand, uh, to get a good idea what they were worn in this period, we could turn to things such as effigies. Now, effigies, um, if you don't know what effigies are, they're basically like a tomb um, with a sculpture above it, right? It's kind of like a memorial of the individual that's deceased. And the effigies um, are really rich in detail. They give us a lot of example, a lot of um, specifics of what they were wearing. Um, most of the time, these effigies, uh, specific from the nobility, um, would be wearing his armor. It's how they wanted to be immortalized. They wanted to be remembered now. So the effigies give us a great, great um, idea of what they were wearing. Now, this here is um, the effigy of... Oh, sorry. Um, this um, effigy right here is from no other from uh, Edward of Woodstock or better known as Edward the Black Prince, which is the, um, the son of Edward III, as we all know, the, the one who pre pretty much began the Hundred Years War. And perhaps these are key individuals in the Battle of uh, Cressy. So um, he is wearing um, probably the latest and the most finest armor of his day. 
And we know this simply because of who he was. He was someone of nobility. He was the son of the King of England. So he would have the, the most ref- finest uh, armor and weaponry um, available at this time. Everything would have been made specifically to his body. Um, everything would move accordingly. It was just, it was not only made perfect, it was made by one of the best armors available at the time. And then just to give you an overview, the, the image on the left is, is more of a, of a drawing of, of this effigy. Because sometimes with the photos and for the presentation, they don't really give you um, an, an opportunity to see it as as in as as if you would in person so he's got the the conical classic helmet which is pointy and the reason why it's shaped this way is so that blades could be um if hit they would glide off it's it's sort of like a defense mechanism um and then the bottom part is the aventail which is um a chain mail or a male uh collar piece this obviously protects his his neck his throat and uh certain parts of his shoulders and then he's got the, the pauldrons um, or spaldons on his shoulders, which is articulated with the elbow piece, the, the forearm piece, which is called a van brace, a breastplate. On the bottom of the breastplate, he has a thing called a fold, which is almost like a skirt. And then in the bottom part, his legs, which are called queases, are also fully covered. Uh, the back of his legs are not usually covered. Usually they have openings, although his calves would be completely covered. So he has a really, really fine... Uh, set of armor and again not only it looks great on it's going to offer the best protection available at the time so uh, these effigies are a really great way to study the arms and armor here's another one from the 14th century and as you could see um, you know every 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 rivet every um, buckle every um, every piece there looks like it could work um, and it does. So, um, and you see the belt he has in the bottom, that's a plaque belt. That's also a, a, a belt with, it's not really necessarily armor. It's just like a form of status. It, it pretty much lets people know that he has the wealth and he has like, um, he comes from a, a noble background and, um, you know, it, it, it really shows that armor wasn't just something to protect you, but it also lets you know, um, like who you were it's almost fashionable in some respects um people didn't have to wear certain armor and as we'll see later in the presentation there'll be specific armors that are gilded with designs and certain features and this is again this doesn't protect you in a battle but in some way it will and we'll go into that later um but this is just a way of letting people know where you are in in society versus the um the lower class. Now, speaking of the lower class soldiers, and we know there are plenty of them, um, we we don't have effigies for those individuals, right? Because they were not, obviously, uh, they did not have the, the, the same wealth as the nobles, the knights, the lords, or the son of kings, and so on and so forth. So um, the, we don't have um, ways of learning from them, at least not arms like this. So we'd have to look at actual artwork. Um, and that we could go to certain paintings and right here is the um, is, yeah. Um, uh, do you mind if I'll give a little uh, introduction to how the war started? Uh, uh, no, no, we... no, not at all, not at all. Not, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that'd be a great piece. And then I'll, I'll add the arms and armor aspect. Of right, right, and, and specifically the Black Prince. Uh, so the war, uh, re- the war really started because uh, uh, of the contest uh, of the inheritance. Uh, 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 to the French throne, Charles IV, uh, the king of uh, um, uh, France, died in 1328 without a male uh, um, uh, successor. Uh, and uh, as you know, there was a, a salient Franks a law that uh, only male uh, could, beca- could become uh, kings, could rule the country. You know, unlike uh, in Britain, as you know, uh, there were a uh, number of females that ruled, but no, not in France. Uh, so therefore, uh, he died without uh, male heir. And that was the end of the dynasty of Capetings. You know, this is the third dynasty of the um, uh, Franks. Uh, they, uh, they started with Merovingian dynasty that was uh, uh, followed by the uh, Carolingian dynasty uh, and uh, uh, um, um, Ch- Charlemagne uh, is uh, uh, was he, his father Pippin the Fourth took over, and now uh, the, then it was continued with Captain with uh, Hugh Capet started. Now this Captain dynasty 
uh, extinguish itself. And, and, and the, the next uh, king, it would be a new dynasty of Valois uh, and the second cousin of uh, uh, Charles IV, uh, 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 Philip uh, uh, V, uh, he became the next king. However, you know, the sister of Charles IV, Isabel the Fair, married the English king, Edward II, and uh, his son, Edward III, considered himself to be uh, 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 closer. He was much closer to uh, dynasty, uh, but uh, because his uh, mother was female, uh, he, he was not allowed. And because of this contest, uh, the war started, and Edward III is the one who uh, uh, invaded uh, France. And there was a Battle of Crecy in uh, 1346, uh, ended up in disaster for. Uh, John the second, John the good, uh, you know, and maybe later I will tell a little bit about him because it's a very interesting story um, uh, about his life and uh, his uh, uh, captivity and uh, what developed later on. But that's just basically, uh, you know, the captain dynasty got extinguished because of no male heir. And uh, now the new dynasty Valois, and that was contested by the uh, English king Edward III, who was son of Isabel the Fair, daughter of uh, Charles IV. So that that's basically it. Uh, uh, that's the idea how it all started. Thank you so much, Greg. And he was just a, uh, a teenager at the time, right? When he um, took the throne from... Was he, uh, how old was he? Uh, not... I, I, think, I think he was already uh, of age. He oh, was? He was? Uh, yeah, he was of age. I, I don't remember exactly his age. But uh, he was of age, and uh, he basically started uh, the war uh, pretty soon. Um, so, okay, got it. Thank you so much for setting that up. Um, okay, so yes, as we were discussing, the 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 armor of this period um, was very very developed. Um, uh, but however, we're going to go back a little to see uh, get an idea of of what the armor was prior to that. So as I was saying, um, the we have a good idea what the nobles, the people of high status wore um, in these battles, uh, but we don't ha really have an idea so much as the the common soldier, the archer, um, well, you know, the, the poor soldier. And so for that, we have to look for actual artwork um, and paintings and so forth. So here is a painting. Um, from the 14th century uh, is actually a, a, a battle that took place in Spain, the Battle of Najera um, against two monarchs from Castile and Tramastera. Um, and that's not important. It's What's important is that uh, let's look at what they're wearing. So the, the top right part, uh, we could see there, there are two soldiers, knights or um, men in arms that are all on horseback. Although probably the, the, the back there might be on foot. They have their banners and they have their spears. And we can see they're very heavily armored. Um, so these would be, you know, um, very high status um, soldiers, knights, men in arms, and so forth. Uh, but to the bottom part, we could see um, the four individuals. They might be more like foot soldiers, um, archers specific, especially the ones on the left. And we could see what they're wearing. So this is a good uh, point of reference to get an idea of what some of the soldiers uh, would have been wearing if they didn't have uh, or they weren't able, they didn't have access to plate armor necessarily or, or any type of armor. So as you can see, the 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 archer with the green top, um, he's got a helmet on and he might have um, uh, uh, a neck piece, which is called a gorget. Um, and perhaps he might have a breastplate underneath there, which he covered by um, a green fabric on, on outside. Uh, although we're not 100% sure, he might have a male shirt, a chain male shirt underneath there, um, just to cover his, his torso area. But again, it's not, we're not sure. He has no protection in his arms or his leg area. Uh, the one to the left of him is similarly armed, uh, only he looks like he does have armor in his his arms. So, um, and this is really uh, interesting because um, as we get into the long bowman, um, people believe that wearing um, when you when you shoot a bow, you have to be trained and have to be lightweight. It's hard to wear armor when you're operating a bow 
Uh, but obviously he's trained and he could wear armor because armor obviously could add a little, not discomfort, but it's not the same as not wearing armor. And also it has a weight to it. So he's able to function um, a bow and an arrow in, in, the, in the battlefield and while at the same time wear armor, which is uh, pretty significant. And then the ones across to him, they look like uh, they're just fighting with a spear. The one looks like he's carrying a sling, although I doubt that's the case. Uh, but you can see that some of them, it's a mix and match situation. They're not all armed down to the T like the, the individuals on the top um, or um, or they have some have armor in certain areas and some don't. So we get an idea of uh, the individual pretty much wore uh, what they could afford. It wasn't uh, centralized um, like a professional army in ancient times or in modern times. Um, so let's look at another uh, painting. Uh, uh, excuse me, Sergio. Yeah. There is a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if the Hundred Years' War is the first war between English and French, and if you don't mind, I could like could try to give a quick answer to that. Yeah, I, I was going to say yes and no. <laughs> right? Well, no, no, that definitely was a conflict. Uh, because first of all, you know that the uh, uh, Nor Norman uh, uh, William the Conqueror, who was uh, Normandy, I mean, he was Norman, not exactly French. It's uh, right. uh, the descendant of the Vikings, but he's the one who uh, conquered the uh, Britain. Uh, uh, but then his descendant, uh, Henry II, uh, married uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, and uh, the whole Aquitaine, uh, which is a big portion of southern France, belonged now to um, uh, uh, Britain, uh, in addition to uh, Normandy and Brittany, uh, because it has become a part of the inheritance uh, from William the Conqueror. So uh, eventually, by the time of the Richard Lionhearted, uh, there was a very powerful king uh, in France, Philip II, appeared. They both participated in the Third Crusade at the end of the 12th century. And after, at, at the end of it, uh, uh, after Richard returned from captivity, he was uh, held for ransom. Uh, there was a war. Richard actually died in France fighting with Philip II because he tried to take uh, uh, all the French lands uh, back. After his death, his brother John de Lackland uh, uh, eventually, through his life, managed to lose all the territories in France uh, to uh, Philip II. Uh, and as a result, uh, Britain now was had no land um, uh, in, in France. So that, that, that was some kind of a conflict, you know, so, and that happened uh, at the end of the 12th century, beginning of the 13th century. Uh, so that, that was probably the first uh, real engagement. Uh, they conducted the many, many wars there. Uh, I don't want to go into more details, but uh, I hope I answered this. Thanks. Sergio, before we move on, uh, can you talk about a little bit of, um, on regarding to the bow, right? Because you know, Mongo, you know, uh, Mongols had a compound of bow that took about two years to um, to make. Um, how did the how did the bowmen fare? First of all, and did it take that long for a bow to uh, to be uh, composed or constructed? And then no, who were the no. butter? Go ahead. Um, the the composite bow that you're talking about, which uh, that goes way back even before the Mongols. Um, I think it goes back from the Assyrians that took, yeah, that had, um, um, many different materials. It had, um, uh, wood, horn and sinew and sinew is a tendon of the animal. And they would use a glue to bond these materials together, which would take, uh, anywhere between 18 months to two years. Again, it varied. It's not always that long, um, but it did take a long time. Um, but with that, it also was a much smaller bow, um, which we, um, would able to, to have a lot more strength, um, when you, when you would, uh, pull it back and draw it back, um, allowing them to, to fire at long distances and on horseback. Um, so that was the advantage of that particular bow but no the 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 long but the english longbow uh is made of a wood called yew and that's just a natural wood that has a bond uh naturally has a strong bond that allows you to pull it back flexibly uh, and then and then it goes back to its original shape uh it did not take nowhere near as long as the composite bow and there's a lot of going back and forth as to which bow is powerful um uh, you know I, I think it depends on how you're using it. Obviously, the the, comp the, the composite bow it has a huge advantage that you could uh, use it on horseback. 
I don't think the long bow can do that because it's so long and it might be hard to get a, a grip on the horse while carrying a, a ball of that size. So that's why we don't see that. Uh, we didn't see that in, in, in specifically in, in Hundred Years War or anything like that. So that's my opinion with with that. Um, those two type of bows. I hope I answered your question. Yes, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, okay, so uh, here's another um, painting from the uh, the 14th century. Uh, Sergio, somebody asked if you could expand the picture to a full screen. Uh, I don't know. Is it the, Are you in presentation mode? I think there is one on the upper right. How's that? Okay. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Okay, great. So here we have um, uh, a battle taking place. Um, it looks like they're storming a castle and the defenders are are trying to uh, keep the 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 the, uh, the offensive from from advancing um so i want to look at the specific individuals and what they're wearing so let's look at the archers on the on the on the right um as you can see they're wearing um the one with the looks like he's wearing a hat he's wearing a um a helmet called a kettle helm and it actually looks like a hat it's made of it might be made of multiple pieces of of steel um, or it might be dished out. Um, it looks like it's made of one piece. And that's pretty much all he's wearing. Um, everything else is uh, padded armor. Um, very likely, it's just basically layers of linen that um, could protect him against, uh, I mean, it's not as good as obviously plate armor or chainmail armor, uh, but it's something that he could afford. This is why he doesn't really have anything um, other than the helmet. And so that's that's what he he's wearing. So it gives a good understanding of the type of soldiers um, next to him on the right, we'll see uh, another archer. Uh, he's got the, 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 the classic bassinet helmet, the pointy uh, style helmet with uh, the aventail, which is the chainmail part that, that goes in the, the collar part. Um, so he looks like he, he has a little bit more armor than the, the archer in front of him, but hard to see if he has any plate armor. I feel he doesn't. I think he has just the same thing, a padded quilted um, gamison type of jacket on that again offers some protection but nothing on the legs nothing on the feet uh nothing on the arms that at least we could see and then to the right of that it looks like there's a, a bunch of other soldiers that also have the same helmet um they're carrying um uh, spears and um and it might be mix and match some might have leg armor some might not um but you get the point the point is that not everybody was uh equipped with the same uh, weapons or armor at the time. So um, th that's kind of like what we'll see throughout this period. It's uh, the armor is, is really hard to come by um, being the fact that it's so expensive and it takes a long time to make. And so not everybody, um, especially from your lower soldier will have access to it, so, but this will change in time. Um, and then the, um, the, the soldiers on the left, um, there they have the visors down. So you get an idea of how it, it's worn um, when they want to, um, when they engage in a conflict, they have to wear it so that um, it protects them. But when that, when you do that, it limits them. It doesn't, you know, uh, it, it, it restricts them from their, their sight, uh, from their um, breathing the capability. And here, and of course, wearing those helmets, it does protect you um, but it also limits you at the same time. Now, and I'll be mentioning that over and over uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so let's talk about one of the early uh, forms of armor um, in general, and that's going to be chain mail. Now, chain mail or mail, as usually what it's known as in the arms and armor community, a chain mail, that's actually a, a term that came around during the Victorian era. Um, just to describe it, uh, because the word male might have been confused as actual male. So uh, chain mail is actually saying the same thing as male, um, you know, uh, and chain mail. It's the same. It's, it's the same word. So chain mail basically or male is basically a, um, a series of rings that are interlocked with each other, creating a fabric, if you will. Um, and it, this offers a great amount of protection. And as you can see, each one of these rings is uh, inter interconnected with the other uh, and then it's secured with a rivet 
So somebody had to make all these rings by iron um, or steel and then put them together and then put a ribbon in each one. So as you can imagine, this would take a lot of work. Um, it's it's not um, uh, hard to make it. It's just very time consuming. OK, somebody had to paint, say, put all this together it would take hours amongst hours. Um, but it did. It was effective. It did offer a lot of protection. And like I said, this, this, we don't know how far uh, male armor goes. Uh, we know that the, the Persians used it, the Romans used it, the Vikings used it. Um, it's been used in all throughout uh, different cultures in Europe. Um, and, and some were better made than others. Like, for example, there's found some male that has that are just butted. They don't have the rivet to give that extra secure. Um, and some, uh, the, the standard arm, um, male armor would have these rivets to get, to make it more, um, to give it more strength. Uh, the Romans definitely had a, a armor called Lorca Hamata and, and it was sort of like a vest, if you will, a tunic shaped um, vest that was made of, of this type of, of, of rings. So, um, and like I said, it, it's, it's very secure, but it's not, um, it's not hundred percent effective. So if someone was to try to strike you or slice you, uh, try to lacerate you, it would definitely be effective. It very likely would not open or it would not allow the blade or the weapon to, to puncture you. However, if somebody tries to thrust a spear uh, or a sword, or an arrow had, um, it's possible that these these rivets would break and the rings will open and it might go through. So with that, you would wear underneath a padded um, a vest or a, a padded coat. Like the individual we just saw, that archer that didn't have any armor, he would have a padded coat, either called an arm and jacket or a gamut um, This uh, would, yeah. Sergio, I apologize. There are a couple of questions here. So one is related to the previous uh, slide and uh, somebody is asking, what is the long tube uh, uh, defenders are using the, what's, what's that for? Uh, do, you have, do you know? This slide right here? Uh, yes, uh, I think so. Yes. The long yes. tube. There is, I think there is a long tube here. Uh, you see the vertical one? This right uh, here? Uh, no, 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 defenders, defenders on uh, the, the big one lower. Yeah, this, this, this? Yeah. yeah, I believe, I believe that's the door. Oh, no, no, it, lo it looks like it looks like they're putting something in there, they're pouring some uh, uh horrible some hot... stuff in there. Oh, you know what? I never noticed that. Them. Yeah, I thought he was he was getting ready to throw a rock at them. Okay. Um, that's and... a good question. No, hmm. sorry, sorry, I'll just add to that. Uh, so uh, defenders used to uh, put boiling oil or a manure uh, down that shaft to throw it at the attackers. This was done um, during the uh, defending of the walls. And um, obviously, two had the opposite effect. But if you would watch any movie that went through the medieval time, this is how they conducted the, the defense of the uh, walls. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there is a question is... Um... If that was a uh, if that was a standing army or volunteers conscript or both, uh, both a little bit of everything. Yeah, they it would in this period of time they would be higher. I mean, you have knights, you have men at arms. Um, yeah, conscripts definitely. A little yeah, bit of I, I think I think usually uh, every lord had his own small army. I mean, I don't know how small. Uh, stand like and and as long as a king and each baron or uh, count had it, his own army, but then he could also ask uh, uh, the the uh, to bring the conscripts uh, in the time of the war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, depending on, on the situation. Um, okay, so so that's yeah, that's basically how chainmail works. Um, it is an effective armor. And um, and it's used all throughout the the middle eight, the, the medieval period, um, even into the the 16th century, and the New World, they will use chainmail. Chainmail is just widely used all, all around. Um, but there was some plate armor uh, around this time. So uh, let me just make this larger. Um, and basically, oh, sorry about that. Uh, what did I do? Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, so the plate armor was basically, um, made that larger for you and move that there. Okay. 
So uh, there was plate armor in this period in time, but it were smaller plates, right? It's not like the armor that we'll see later. Um, they were able to put pieces of iron in a forge and hammer it into a shape. Okay, so um, they were able to make helmets and they were able to make um, certain pieces of body armor. Uh, but the way they would attach these pieces of body armor was through a harness of some sort, right? So the, the more common form of armor, uh, plate armor at this period in time, again, 12th, 13th century, would be this thing called the coat of plates. And the coat of plates is exactly what it sounds. It's basically like a vest, almost like a bulletproof vest of its day, where they would have multiple uh, pieces of iron, uh, that would be uh, integrated with either leather, linen, and it would be worn either over the male armor or under it. Now, to the left is another effigy of St. Maurice, who's more of a biblical fear figure, but somehow they created a, uh, a, effigy, a statue of him. Sorry, it's not an effigy. It's a statue of him. And this is one of the first uh, archaeological evidence that we, we could see that there was plate armor around this period um, in the form, as I described, as a coat of plates. So they would be just um, plates underneath there made of iron that would allow him to move, but at the same time would give him um, an extra layer of protection. Because as I said, the male armor alone would not do um, would not give him all the security he needs if he was to be hit with a spear or lance or um several arrows at once. Um, to the right, obviously, it's a modern reconstruction that, but it gives you an idea of, of what it might have looked like, what it might uh, look like worn on somebody. Uh, it has looked like it has um, four pieces in the front and maybe another four pieces in the back. And, you know, overall, it's comfortable. It's, it's, it's secure. It's probably heavy because it's made of iron. And, um, but I, I, as I said, the, these individuals were trained to wear this uh, constantly. So you're probably wondering, well, if they were able to make steel, I mean, make these iron plates, why couldn't they make them into larger breastplates and helmets, as we'll see later? Well, the reason is because they couldn't get the furnaces hot enough, right? They used to get these furnaces really, really hot so they could get large pieces of coal, I'm sorry, of iron, so hot that you then shape them into larger um, forms of armor, whether it be a one helmet or a breastplate or a backplate, or an arm piece or, uh, or a leg piece and so on. So they weren't, a, they didn't have the technology to do this around this time. So that's why they had to opt with making smaller pieces um, that allow you to, to um, make it larger. All right, so now here's um, a drawing and an actual um, side. Um, so this to the right is uh, the um, a 13th century helmet, uh, also known as a great helm. <laughs> helmet and um this helmet as you could see I mean, you might be able to see this clear but the drawing to the left will help you better this is actually a helmet made of multiple pieces it's not one single piece it's made um at least five pieces in the front and perhaps another five in the back okay and as i said they weren't able to make it into one piece at this point in time so they had to use uh, layers or rivets to hold everything together um <clears throat> excuse me this makes it a lot um a lot more work to do obviously and not only that these helmets were a lot heavier uh than the ones later um to the left are obviously a drawing but you can see how the these helmets were constructed they're not um they're they use multiple pieces and and it, it's just it you could tell it, it's um it's not so refined as we'll see later now the top piece um uh, right here this is a like a flat top helm and this is like the classic crusade. I always saw this as the crusader type of helmet. Um, that's a nice looking helmet. And it, as you can see, it's not fully covered as the other ones. So this is good in a way because A, it doesn't get too hot because you have uh, areas where it's not covered and you can also hear better. Uh, but the problem with that helmet is that, well, if somebody hits you over the head, um, it's going to absorb all the blows and it, it's you, the, the wearer is certainly going to feel it uh, because it, you know, it has nowhere to go. If someone's to hit him over the head with, let's say an ax or a mace or a sword and so forth. Um, so this is why in addition to the, the gamut the padded jacket that they wear underneath the mail, they would also wear a uh, coif, which is a padded headpiece um, that little drawing right here that would have been made of layers of linen. And he would wear that underneath the helmet. I mean, he'd have to wear, he'd also wear it underneath the, the coif um, chain mail. So there'd be a chain mail uh, or mail hood 
uh, that they would wear. They would wear padded underneath that. I know you see a lot of the movies that we see today. Uh, it looks like they just wear a male hood over their skull, over their heads. But that really wasn't the case. That would that would just be really uncomfortable, and it would actually be um, more uh, uh, dangerous than not wearing it. Uh, if you don't wear anything underneath the armor as a padded, um, while it might protect you from getting cut and so forth, but you're going to get some serious bruising. Um, fractures and perhaps even internal bleeding. So they had to wear padding underneath the, the armor, the steel and, and the iron armor. Otherwise it would just, just be uh, counterproductive. At the bottom here, as we could see, they start to develop these pointed style helmet. Um, and this is very important as we saw earlier in the effigy of the, the Black Prince. Um, this, they realized that having a helmet like this would not necessarily be um, a good choice when fighting in battle, simply for the fact that the blades are just going to, the, 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 the percussions, the blows are just going to go straight to the helmet and cause a lot of shock for the wearer. So now they're trying to shape them more conical so that they could um, alleviate this, this type of stress. And again, this is around the 12th, 13th century. Um, this is a, a um, these are more flat top helmets. This is from the Masajowski Bible or the Morgan's Bible as is known. Um, this is a great collection of works. It's basically the Holy Bible, but it's, it's drawn um, with 13th century images. So this is a good reference to uh, understand what people were wearing. It's not just arms and armor, but just clothing and fashion and, and all together. If, if you want to see what people wore around this time. That's a, a good um, a source to, to understand or to look at. Um, okay, so now we're getting to the 15th century. And in the 15th century, they were now sp uh, able to get these forges um, really hot to the point where they can now work with large pieces of, 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 of iron. Okay. Uh, Sergio, uh, before yeah. you go, uh, can I uh, tell the yes. story about the King John, uh, the, the second, because it happened in the 14th century. Please. I just want to, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't. Uh, is it okay? So, uh, I mean, basically, uh, all this armor uh, is, is extremely expensive. And one of the, uh, uh, you know, gains that you, uh, spoils of the war is like capturing a knight or uh, the, the uh, you know, the uh, more, more status to the knight, the more expensive armor. And of course, the knight himself would be held for ransom. So uh, there are three major battles that happened during the Hundred Year War. Uh, battle of Crecy in 1346, uh, battle of, uh, uh, that, that was uh, led by Edward III, the king himself, then battle of Poitiers in, in 1356, that's uh, by his son, the Black Prince, uh, and then also the most famous uh, other battle. There were many, many battles, of course. They, I'm talking about the three most important ones is the Battle of uh, Agincourt, uh, which is in 1415, and it was entirely different. It was a King Henry V. So, but in the Battle of Poitiers, uh, I, I, I pronounce it in a certain way that some people may know, maybe Poitoy, uh, I don't know. Uh, so in what happened is the King of the France, King John II was taken captive. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, there was a horrendous uh, ransom that was supposed to be paid for him uh, that would actually basically suck the whole France dry. Uh, uh, meanwhile, he was uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in England um, and uh, they're trying to get all that tribute for quite a long time. They just couldn't get it. Uh, eventually, British, uh, uh, the uh, English decided to um, they decided to send the king himself so that he could collect, you know, the tribute. He could collect the ransom himself. But in his turn, they took his second son, uh, Louis, Count of Anjou. Uh, uh, so Count of Anjou, his second son, the first son was an heir. Obviously, they couldn't do it. He came to England and was held captive while John II went to France. So he uh, created what they call uh, the currency franc, uh, and he tried to reorganize administration in order to collect all this tremendous uh, uh, ransom for himself. Uh, and uh, after, uh, after a couple of years, they found out that his son, 
uh, Louis, Count of Anjou, escaped from Britain and came to France. That was like tremendous scandal. So John II considered that it's a matter of honor and because he gave his solemn promise and he voluntarily returned into captivity in 1364. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reason uh, he, he has a title, John the Good, because uh, it, it, everybody was shocked because it has never happened before that the king voluntarily returned because it's a matter of honor. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as he returned, he unfortunately got sick and died that same year. So I thought it was an interesting story uh, that happened during this, like in the middle of the 14th century. Um, uh, and, and obviously now you see that the, this is very expensive armor. Uh, when you capture someone, you have the whole armor. It now belongs to you. And that's cost a lot of money. Okay, that's, that's all. Right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And yeah, so that was like, that's almost written out of history. Most people don't know that there was a King Louis um, for a short time, right? Uh, in, in England, Greg? Uh, what, what King Louis? What, what are you talking about? No, you said the king went back to France voluntarily? Yeah, that's King John, John, John II. Oh, oh okay. Uh, he, he, he came, it's a French king. He came back, he came to England uh, on his own volition because it was a matter of arm, uh, uh, right. honor. His, his, his second son, Louis, who was held there for, instead of him because he went to France to collect the uh, uh, ransom, ransom. Uh, he escaped. He did something illegal, something dishonorable. And the right. king had to, uh, uh, you know, maintain the honor. And he, uh, he promised, uh, he assured, you know, that now his son will be, now he escaped. Uh, he, he, he was a, a person of, it's, it says something about sense of honor, uh, uh, you know, that existed at that time. That the king, you know, he could have stayed there. No, nobody could ever get him again. Uh, but he just went into captivity because it's a matter of, by the way, when he came to England, they, uh, uh, they met him uh, with like a lot of people. They gave him a lot of honor. Everybody was extremely impressed by this gesture, you know? And so it's, uh, uh, well, Louis, uh, Count of Anjou was never a king in France. He, his, his brother uh, became king after the death of the John II. Hmm. Very cool. Um, okay, great. So um, getting back to the armor, um, as I said, in the 15th century, they were now able to make the furnaces um, a lot larger and they were able to now employ uh, bellows. So bellows are kind of like an accordion fan, which then provides oxygen into the, the chamber of the these furnaces, which now makes the fire hotter. Um, and now they could get um, large pieces of, of iron so hot that you can now make large pieces of, of, of arms and armor, particularly uh, helmets and breastplates and stuff like that. Um, another thing that they able to, to develop around this time is this technique called quenching and tempering. So what, what they do is they basically put the, uh, the iron in and then they shape it into what they want, right? Let's just say it's a helmet or a breastplate, stuff like that. And once they have the look and the feel that they want, it's still not ready yet. It doesn't have the, the, the max potential uh, to be a, a strong piece of armor, uh, especially for somebody who were in battle. So they want to harden it. And how they do that is they reheat the whole uh, piece of armor. Let's just say it's a breastplate. And then once it gets to a certain the temperature, now they didn't have the monitors those days, they would have to rely on the color of how the, these um, metals would, would turn once they get so hot. They would turn red, uh, they would turn orange, yellow, even white. So once it got to a certain color, they would then dip it in water um, to change the, the temperature quite rapidly. Um, what this does, this changes the atomical structure of the metal. It, it traps the carbon atoms in. Well, they, they didn't know this at the time, but that's pretty much what's happening, um, making it really, really strong. Um, so then that's, that's quenching. Um, now they'll redo this the second time, because if you don't, 
the 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 metal, the, the armor, um, although it's very strong and solid, it's almost like glass or clay. Um, you could drop it on the floor and it will shatter. So you have something strong, but it's also a, it's potentially fragile in some ways. Uh, so they what they do is then they reheat it um, again, and then they repeat the process. They they they, they put it in the water again, they, or the oil or or water, uh, which and this tempers it. Now this this sets the metal back the way it should be, um, making it really, really strong. So now you have a metal or an armor that is um, stronger, as strong as iron, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's lighter, okay? This is steel now. And steel is basically an alloy. Um, it's basically iron with carbon uh, in it, okay? It's, it's almost like bronze in a way. Bronze has copper and tinted, well, steel has uh, carbon and, and, and iron in it. So it's like the best of both worlds. So now you have something that's as strong as iron, but it's lightweight. Steel is a much lighter weight than iron. And at the same time, it's stronger than bronze. And with swords specifically, you could bend it. Once it's, it's tempered, uh, you could bend the sword and it will go back to its original form. You would not be able to do that with iron. Iron doesn't bend. It bends, but it, goes, it stays where it is, um, where a stainless steel or steel sword um, it, had, it retains its, its shape, even though it's slightly bent. So this is a huge breakthrough in not just armor, but just steel making. You know, this could now, um, they can make really strong metals. In fact, today, even today's world, um, steel, I mean, we would not be able to build what we build today if not for steel. We could not go so high up with iron iron is just way too heavy and, and it's just it just doesn't handle as well as steel steel you can make uh eye beams as they do and you can make long structures so um this technique was obviously a huge breakthrough and this happened around the 15th century um during the hundred years war um and then we'll see some really really fantastic uh forms of armor uh that come about it um let's go look at some and here's a, a nice example of a, of a breastplate um, around the 14th century, late 14th century. Um, and it's, it's a solid, it's, it's a Milanese, um, and it's a solid for the upper body. I don't think there's a back piece. And um, this, is, this is a very common um, type of um, uh, a breastplate that you would see around the Agincourt in that period. And the thing, the way it's constructed, um, it has this V shape. A uh, rib in the center of it, and that's primarily to stop um, um, if a, if a blade of a spear or sword was to uh, try to puncture in in the in the abdomen area, uh, and it's obviously going to slide upward. This V shaped rib is going to guide it out of the direction of the wearer's uh, neck piece or throat. So this is um, another form of defense. Those little uh, four knobs on the left, that's um, an attachment piece or attachment for, to hold on a, to add to another piece that's going to um, rest the, the lance uh, if, he, if he's fighting on horseback. Uh, but again, that's for a more advanced um, type of soldier. So um, the two top armor makers at the time were um, in two countries, one in Germany, in Oxford or Nuremberg. Uh, but more Oxford was more uh, known for its armor. And in, in Italy, in Milan, they also were world-renowned world for making the top armors. If, if, if you were someone of status and you could afford it, you would have your armor made in one of these cities um, by the top armors of their day. They were like the, the Porsche and Ferrari, I always like to think, um, because they just were masters of the craft. And they, you know, they had really good but expensive armor um wait, i wanted to go back to that piece so um wait one second i want to show what the individual's wearing yeah, here we go so um so the individual on the right the photo on the right the drawing um gives you uh, another drawing from that period of a fully armed individual with um he could be a knight he could be a man in arms um he's got that black belt again um he's fully fully armored um with the helmet with the bassinet the um He's, he's carrying a pole axe. He's got the breastplate and everything. Everything seems to be armed except for his bottom part, right? His shoes, his feet. It looks like he's wearing either leather uh, boots or shoes. Now, um, 
there's a reason for that. Um, he clearly doesn't need or doesn't want to wear armor. He could totally afford it. He could have the sabatons, which is the armor part for the, the feet. But um, for him, it makes more sense to be mobile. Um, as I said earlier, when it comes to armor, um, it's a trade-off with be being more protected, but at the same time being restricted. The more protected you are, the more restricted you become, especially when certain parts of your body as I said earlier with the helmet, um, you know, you could have a great helmet that protects every part of your uh, head. Uh, but again, it's going to limit your vision, your breathing, your hearing, and so forth. Same thing with the rest of the body. So um, he doesn't have um, the, the, the feet protection, which is the sabatons, uh, most likely because he feels that he could run faster with it. He could get up if he falls with it. It's just, it, it's more advantageous for him. And we'll see that in a lot of other uh, soldiers uh, or knights or noblemen that that necessarily don't have, want to be completely armored. It, it's, it's like a combination. It's what works better for um, the individual. Um, so again, here's another slide of uh, the type of armor from this period. <clears throat> this is actually a little later. Um, from the two types of um, uh, armor makers, the top piece, uh, the, I'm sorry, the one on the left is the Milanese style armor, which has a very smooth, simple design, but yet really, really elegant. Um, I like this particular style. Um, and then the one to the right is the more German Gothic style. Um, this is also very popular. And what makes the Gothic one really distinct from the other armors, is it's, it usually has these flutes, these ribs on, on the armor in itself as you can see it's got like those lines and those those flutes serve a purpose i mean not just for aesthetic they give it a nice look to it but they actually serve a function they're they're like um a shock blow uh, absorber uh they're kind of like a comb on the top of a, a helmet they when you you hit that they slow the blade versus if you had it flat kind of like the milanese one so they were uh, uh you know a function that that actually protected the the wearer a little more than if he didn't have it and it has a nice look to it as well um but yeah they're both pretty pretty st uh high status armor and um, again, they look completely different, but it, it, I think it's just preference on the individual. Now, going back to the what I said about earlier, the, the one on the left, the Milanese one, uh, it, it's 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 possible that this armor is not complete in the sense that he doesn't have the hands, which is the gauntlets, or the feet, which is the sabatons. Um, perhaps it got lost somehow in, in, in hit in time, or um, perhaps, as I said earlier, there was never any. Um, gauntlets or song, uh, sabatons, which is a feet armor to begin with. The, the, the wearer, the, the soldier didn't have that made for him or didn't want to wear it because of the fact that he wanted to have his hands uh, more in mo motion uh, and his feet as well. So um, again, this is, this is something very common. Sometimes people think that, oh, they just lost it in time, but nope, they perhaps did, didn't need it, didn't want it and did without it. Obviously the one on the left has fully plate armor and is pretty functional um and it's yeah it's it's a very nice set of armor both of those so um let's look at the so now that armor has reached its 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 maximum potential um compared to previous uh decades the weapons are obviously going to change right because now you have these solid hardened uh plates of metal protecting the wearer um, so now the, the standard uh, sword or spear tip um, needs to be um, improved in some way or another. So uh, these are the basic weapons that you'll see around this period. The, the, the first one on the left is a, uh, a weapon called a, a bill. And that's uh, kind of like a three in one weapon. It has it's a, it's a pike and the point, the puncture armor. And then to the left part, it has that hook to grab on people's feet uh, or to pull somebody off a horse. Um, and then has a spike on the left for, uh, you know, for doing more damage. Um, the one on the right is a pole axe, which is similar to the bill, but it just doesn't have that hook feature. Um, the two bottoms are also, uh, the one that's ne next to that is uh, another uh, type of axe weapon, pole axe weapons. They're more Swiss, but they, they serve the same function as, as the pole axe. And then the ones to the right, um, these are basically um, blow weapons, right? These are just weapons to pretty much hit at the individual not necessarily puncture them um the mace is is just to hit at somebody perhaps damage them 
uh, their armor, knock off their helmet, that kind of stuff. Uh, if they're not wearing any armor, obviously bruise them up. Now, interesting, all these weapons, um, uh, with exception to the mace, they're all, the, the mace is considered to be the first weapon of war, right? Um, that, when the, and the mace goes back to uh, ancient times to the Samar Sumerian people um, thousands of years ago, the, the, and they were using maces then. The, every other weapon um, somehow evolved from a tool, right? The ax is obviously a tool for chopping out trees. Um, a sword, obviously, descended from a dagger. A dagger is a knife, um, uh, and so on and so forth. A hammer, obviously, that's a tool. But the mace, there really isn't any function in mace other than to use in battle. So, so the mace is considered to be the first weapon of war all around. Now, the other weapons next to the mace, is uh, these are called war hammers. And their function is just like a hammer or a club, uh, only they have a spike uh, on their other side of it. And this is uh, primarily to puncture the armor because, um, as I said, the armor has, has evolved. It's more advanced. And so they have to now um, improve the weapons to try to, you know, do the damage as they can. Uh, they're not very nice weapons. So, um, yeah, here's another uh, photo of a uh, 14th century knights. Um, and this, as I said earlier, they, they're, they're fully decked out in armor. Um, with, with the exception, um, no, I'm sorry, plate armor with the exception on their, on his back, right? It, says, it looks like this is the same individual. No, I'm sorry. It's another individual. One's on foot and one's on horseback. And as you can see, um, it's not like they couldn't afford, um, a back, uh, piece, but no, it, it makes more sense for him to be without a back piece because it, it's more comfortable, especially if he's riding on a horse, um, and he's more mobile and, um, and, and basically, he, he decides to be less protected, but at the same time, be more mobile, simply for the fact that he's able to um, uh, be more endurance, have more endurance in battle, and so forth. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here we have uh, the type of helmet that is pretty common uh, during the Hundred Years' War, particularly in the um, Battle of uh, Agincourt. This is the bassinet from the Wallace Collection. The Wallace Collection in England is um, one of the, the most uh, recognized areas for, for arms and armor, particularly in, in the 14th and 15th century and all around. And they have a wonderful collection of helmets and, and, and so forth. And so this helmet right here uh, is intact. This is um, from around the 14th century, very rare. And um, as you could see, this is, I mean, what somebody would have wore if they could afford it. Um, the, the, the eyepiece, they're, they're almost like slits of a castle in which they could, um, you're able to see out, but not so much you could see in, at least from someone outside. And then the, obviously the classic uh, conical shape, uh, top part so that the blades could glance off. He's got the admin tail, which is the male part and the, and the throat area. Um, and then the breathing, he's got a, a whole series of holes on the left side. Um, and he also has a, a, an opening in the bottom part. Um, this helmet actually has a few names for it. They call it a pig face bassinet uh, or a hound skull. Um, this is the, the type of names they have for it in English. It does remind me of a little bit of pig, but not so much. Um, but this is a really, really nice helmet. And um, I want to show you another helmet that I have myself. This is a Cherbourg style helmet. I don't know if you can see me. Oh, you know what? Let me, let me, uh, how do I put that? Oh, sorry. Uh, Zach, how do I make my side bigger? Just, just stop sharing. Oh, okay. Stop sharing. Okay. Now, can you see me? Yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, okay, great. So this is a Cherbourg style Hemet CH69. If you can see that. Um, sorry, the light's blocking it. All right. So that's how that looks. Um, it's a replica, it's not real. I um, just want to give you an idea of the construction. It's got a, uh, the pointy helmet part, as I said. Here would be the, um, the, the linen, um, um, padded piece, um, which is obviously you wear over them to give you protection. 
Um, here is the, the attachment that you would uh, put the visor part with. Um, and as you can see, it's a uh, one big solid construction and uh, nothing for the ears. So when you wear this, you're really limited in the vision and the human aspect. Um, this is the face plate of it. So you can see it's got um, holes on one side for the breathing and not on the other side. And the reason is because um, when you put holes, you weaken the metal, right? So now if you have this side that's harder, this one would be softer. So it's on this side because in the middle ages, just like today's world, most people were right-handed. So they're most likely going to hit this side before they hit this side. So that's why you always see the bassinet with holes on the, the left-hand side. Um, as far as the, the vision, I'm, I'm putting this on and I could see um, a pretty good. It's not 100%, but I could get a good idea of what's going around me. Um, so it's limited, but it does... I do feel very protected because like I said, nothing can really get through. I don't think arrows could get through. Definitely don't think a blade could get through. Um, so this is a really, really good helmet um, around this timepiece. And then you'll see helmets, um, they'll evolve, but they'll still have the same style. They'll have a faceplate that's connected with the main helmet that could go up and down like a visor. And um, it's, a, it's a classic helmet from this period in time. Um, so let's see. Let's go back to the slides. While you were sharing, um, yeah, how hot? How hot was it on the battlefield? Wearing all this armor, uh, if it's just a summer, was there any? Um, uh, I guess contemporaries that would write that I can't really fight because it's just extremely hot. It's just so much metal um, on me. My my guess is yes, it definitely was warm, but that that might have been the least of their worries. I don't think it was as warm as perhaps in Greece or in other areas in the Mediterranean, um, like in the Crusades, um, in Jerusalem. Sorry, that's what I was thinking of. Um, I think in in the, in the European battlefield, again, this is just my speculation. They were used to wearing this um, linen is a little bit uh, less warm than wool. And a lot of the layers were made of linen. And um, as I said, the visor goes up and down. So if you felt like you were warm, you could open it and it'll be a little bit le less uh, less warm. Um, and then the lesser soldiers, they were not decked out in and stuff like that. My, 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 I think the biggest obstacle is the weight um, and the, the sweat that they would um, um generate when when wearing this this armor for long periods of time but i think overall the heat there's not a lot of uh written stuff that says that they were overheated um with it with this stuff unless they, unless they were fighting hours in the sun but my specu my speculation is that they would have um you know the, these were established armies that knew when it was time to fight and when it wasn't although Agincourt seems to be um not well thought of at least on the french's side because of the the rain which we'll discuss later but yeah that, that's that's what i would uh, speculate with that um so now in the 15th century um basically we see the armor fully fully uh developed now we could see um this is an effigy on the on the right part um, this is a, more of a, a gothic style armor, as we were discussing earlier. You got the German style. Um, those round things, those are called rondelles. And what those are, they're basically to protect the little gaps because you're not 100 It's not. There's no way to completely cover your whole body in plate armor and at the same time expect to be moving. So um, that's what those areas are, is to protect that little gap, the little opening where people are going to try to use that. That's like a, a, a breach. Uh, if you will. Now he'll have mail underneath, but still, they want to still be as protected as much as possible. Um, the thing is, that during this period in time in the Hundred Years' War, is when the, one of the few times where we see knights that opt to fight on foot versus horseback. Now, a knight is pretty much known to fight on horse. In fact, a lot of the, the words in other languages, a knight specifically means a rider or horse rider. And I believe the German word for uh, knight is ritter, like the last name ritter, and that means rider, someone that rides a horse. Um, in Spanish, it's uh, caballero, which means horseman from the Spanish word caballo. And I believe French also has a similar word to that. Um, but here, um, because the armor is very well developed, 
and advanced. Uh, they don't need to fight on horse. And not only that, they don't need to carry a shield like they once before. Um, they do have some shields. Question, uh, Sergio, I apologize. No, it's okay. Uh, how much it uh, all, all it weigh? I mean, that's pretty How important. much did it weigh? Yeah. It, it depends on the armor. Um, anywhere between 83 and 85 pounds. That's a, that's a heavy, heavy full suit of armor. But again, it, it varies to vary on what they have. Um, but yeah, it would be somewhere around that, um, that weight. So yeah, it, it is, it is relatively heavy. Um, but I mean, yeah, they, they were trained for that. They certainly knew how to, to take on that weight. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was some, certainly not something you could just, uh, put on once a year and, and expect to, you know, be okay. But anyway, as I was saying, the, the, the Knights would fight on foot now, um, which was a, a new thing. And this would do two things um, for, for two reasons. One, as I said, they don't need a shield anymore as much as they did before. And they don't need the horse as much as they do. And now that, that's, that's one reason. The other reason is that they would boost the morale of the other soldiers. The, the, not, the, obviously, the combatants that were um, foot soldiers, less uh, archers, people that were not heavy armed would fight alongside the knights. So this would obviously boost their morale. I mean, it's nice to see that someone on your level fighting on, on you know, on the battle right next to you. So um, as opposed to fighting on horseback, you know, a couple of hard, uh, yards away. So this was a, a huge uh, breakthrough um, in, in this period in time. So not only the armor um, developed, it also changes the class of the, the soldier. Um, and then the other thing to think about is that, so the, the, these armors, um, where they would get these armor from, right? Um, well, one of the, the main ways, again, it depends on the nobility, you would inherit some of it. If you were fortunate enough, you would inherit some of these plate armors, because like I said, they were very, very expensive. And, um, you know, if, if someone was at an age, they would pass it down to another person. Obviously, if that person was going to be part of the nobility, which most likely they would be. Um, but I, but although I feel like some of it wouldn't necessarily um, be that functional because armor, it's not like it's that uh, transferable in a sense that these specific ones were made to fit your body. And so a father might be taller than his offspring or vice versa. And then it's not always the case that the armor is going to fit like a glove for the next person that inherits it. So um, that's one way. Another way it would be gifted um, or the other way is that they basically would purchase it. They would go to these armors um, who were, there was a, you know, if you were able to go to Italy and Milan or to Germany uh, in Nuremberg and uh, you would have the armor made for you. Now there was a huge network of, of armor makers. It wasn't just one, one individual might've made the helmet. The other one made the sabatons. Um, one person would, would have making rivets. So it was like a huge industry um, that would be like, uh, they would have contracts with Kings and so forth. So the armor was a, was a pretty well-established industry uh, at this point in time um, because well, war was just like today, war is big business. And so there's, there's a lot of accounts of, uh, lords and kings that would just stockpile on armor. They would just have armor on reserve for battles because they know that that's very important should a conflict break out and they need to um, raise an army. You know, what good is an army if they don't have the latest in technology uh, in warfare? So um, armor was, was very important and weapons were very important uh, for these societies and, and it was also very expensive. So they had to make means of how they were going to have access to this. Um, so that's, that's something that needs to be considered. And then, uh, but as time goes, um, as time passes, the armor gets to be a little less expensive because now um, there's many people um, making armor and it becomes more, uh, less of a rare skill. So um, the armor will be accessible to the lower classes. Not, it's not gonna be cheaper, uh, but it's still gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be cheap, but it's gonna be cheaper than it was in, in previous decades. And then the other thing is, is that um, there's also looting, right? There's also the opportunity that uh, a soldier after the battlefield could come across a helmet 
or a, um, a breastplate from someone of, of, of better uh, status, uh, and then they will now uh, own that piece of armor. So that's, that's an opportunity for them to now rise up in the ranks. So um, believe it or not, a lot of archers will um, be able to um, uh, promote themselves to be men in arms uh, just by the fact that they're able to scrape up enough armor or, or funds to buy armor that they can now, uh, you know, rise in status. Whereas before they were archer, they were going to stay archer. And that's kind of how it well, always was. So with this and a combination of other things, gunpowder, we'll see the knights have less of a role compared to the 12th, 13th century, which I think is very interesting. Now, another weapon that comes around the scene, although this weapon has been around since the ancient times, the uh, ancient Greeks actually had an apparatus like this called a crossbow, um, but it was more like a whole body. It was almost like a, a catapult. It was like somebody using one for themselves. Um, but that, that, that weapon, it kind of goes away in the, um, the seventh, eighth century, and then it comes back uh, around the, the time of the Crusades. Uh, it looks like it just resurfaces again um, from the, the Middle Eastern part of the world so the thing about the crossbow it has its, its pros and its cons um the pros is that well the thing about the crossbow um it doesn't require that much skill like that of a a bowman right um it's a very easy to use weapon i mean you still need to know how it works um but you just pretty much pull back the the bow and there's a nut in there that, that carries the 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 rope and then you just fire it kind of like a rifle um and, and so it you know it's a pretty deadly weapon um it's also a close range weapon so it doesn't really allow you to um shoot a target that far away com uh, in comparison to the longbow um the longbow obviously has a lot more draw strength and those those arrows could go f much further than that of um a crossbow at least with accuracy um the other thing about the crossbow is that um, you really? It's not good in the rain. And um, for example, if the if the, the 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 ropes were made of of um, um, hemp, and so if that got wet, it, it would soften it, and it would not be very effective. So um, that that's very important. And you cannot remove these these ropes so easily. Whereas a, a long bow, you can, you could pull out the rope very easily and then put it away until it stops raining and so forth. So these were pretty much uh, weapons that are very mechanical and they're not so easily um, mobile compared to other weapons like the long bow. Um, the long bow, actually, I'm sorry, the crossbow was actually banned at one point because uh, they found it to be really dangerous and um, un immoral. I think Pope Innocent II banned these um to use it against christians um but not sure how much how much that was enforced um the thing about the the crossbow it's also it requires uh strength um to 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 load it right so typically you could uh use your body weight to pull back the bow and load it um but as time passes these uh the bows become much more stronger and so they have to use apparatuses um they use uh some uh, thing called a windlass. If you look at the, the, the painting on the left, you see he's got this mechanical device. It looks like a pulley and that pulls back the, the, um, the rope so that um, it can be loaded. Um, and to the right, right here, you see a mechanical, this looks more like a, a ratchet type of uh, device, which pulls back the rope so they could be loaded as well. Now, so these things take time. Okay. So it's something that, that again, it, it's a, it's a drawback compared to that of a longbow. A longbow, you don't have to do any of that. Longbow, you just, the strength uh, that you have is all you need. And, and that's pretty much what it was, that these archers were trained um, because they spent a long time um, firing um, or shooting these arrows. In fact, I think it was Edward II that made it mandatory that every, um, every boy above the age of 16 after church had to um, practice shooting the longbow. That was just like a, a requirement from the state of England, the, the nation of England. And actually, if I could add, yeah, I mean, the, the longbow uh, uh, that was used in the Hundred Year War uh, actually originated in the Wales 
and it's uh, a, f- a father of uh, Edward the second Edward the first the Longshank right he's the one who conquered uh, uh, he's the one who conquered the Wales and Edward the third was the first Prince of Wales you know from there on it stuck mm-hmm. uh, to the heir of the throne but the the longbow was brought from there and as you said it became a standard uh, weapon usually for the lower class um, and uh, uh, and and it became a secret weapon. I mean that that gave all the advantage, the artillery uh, of the time, uh, all the advantage. That's why uh, almost all the wars that English won uh, during the Hundred Year War uh, were uh, they were severely outnumbered by French, and yet they still war won every time they were outnumbered, uh, and, and they still won. Uh, because of this long bow, it really made all the difference. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to say uh, more uh, about this, but before you do, there is a question uh, uh, in 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 the chat is about uh, the strings. Um, uh, why did why wouldn't they use animal sinews rather than hemp? That's uh, the question. Do you know anything about that? Why do they use to, to make the strings? Why wouldn't why wouldn't they use uh, animal sinews rather than hemp? Um, I, I don't think it, 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 the the sinews could be that elastic. Um, I, again, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm just thinking perhaps it, it, it they were not as effective. Um, the the <laughs> sinews that we used in, in, in the composable. I don't know if, if that person is referring to that. They weren't used in the string. They were used oh, in the shit. bow part of the composable. So it was the composable that had the sinew, not the string. The string w- was made of another material. I'm not sure what it was, but hemp would have made more sense or or I think maybe horse hair. But um, mm-hmm. the, um, to make the, um, the string, I think, um, yeah, they were using hemp for, for what I know. Yeah, that's what I believe. Um, yeah, but thanks, thanks for that um, insight. Uh, by, by the way, they, uh, from what I read, they always like when they march or un- until uh, before the engagement, they 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 never uh, they took the strings off. They only right. put them on before the engagement. Right. They didn't want them to overstretch. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They would. Yeah. They wouldn't leave it there overnight when they weren't using it. They would. The the bowls would always be. Um, you know, uh, upright until it was ready for battle. In fact, it's not even good to fire um, a bow or a crossbow without a projectile. That that messes up the the collab uh, the, the 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 straightness of, of the the whole setup. It, it's you have to have it ready, and it has to be fired properly, or or you could just like not you can mess up the weapon. For what I understand, um, but yeah, that's exactly right. And another thing about the crossbow, man specifically the Genoese is that because of everything I just explained, how um, it takes a long time to load, how sometimes uh, you need time. um, They would have a shield in addition to it. You could probably see a little shield here um, and they carry a shield with them. The shield that have a little bit of a mount. So obviously they couldn't hold a shield with one hand and load um, the crossbow with another hand. It took two hands to, to hold. Uh, to load a crossbow. So they would have like a, um, a shield with a foot on it. Okay. They call it a, a pavise, a pavise in Italian. I believe that's the pronunciation. And um, so you see, they have to carry a lot of uh, things with them, you know, the shield and the, the crossbow and then the apparatus to load the crossbow. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a slow process. If, if you ask me, um, which is probably why the, the battle agent cord um, wasn't successful on, on that front. Um, yes, if, uh, if, if I may... Uh, add yeah, to, yeah, I want you to talk uh, about it because I know you, you know that whole campaign very well. But I just want to talk about the, 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 the archers real quick. Um, so the archers, as I said, they were trained... I mean, the English archers were trained all around since uh, teenagers. And, um, and that was a very common, common um, type of weapon. Everybody knew how to use an archer. Um, in England, thanks to the Welsh, as, as Greg explained. And they would have different t- uh, tips. Uh, right here, these are bodkin tips. And these tips are likely the ones that were used in the Battle of Agincourt, which uh, decimated the, the French when they were trying to um, advance. Um, these tips are pretty uh, effective um, when piercing armor. 
although we don't know if it's necessarily going to kill them. Um, one thing that is debatable today is that we have this idea that the archers would just um, aim their arrows, sorry, aim their bows up into the air and fire the, 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 the arrows, okay? So they all go up in the same direction, creating like a cloud of arrows. And then all of a sudden they decide, the, all, all of a sudden the arrows just because of gravity will go come crashing down like it's raining arrows. We've seen this in countless amount of movies, um, but that's debatable. We don't, we don't, not sure if they really went down like that in the Battle of Agincourt, uh, simply for the fact because arrows were um, costly. They, I mean, to make an arrow, um, it took time. Um, you had to create the, obviously the, the arrow tip by a, a blacksmith, and then you'd have to get the, the shaft and they'd have specific individuals making this. It wasn't made by one individual. And then the fletching, the feathery part, that was made by somebody else. So these arrows had to count. So to, to do that, it necessarily, um, it, it didn't always make sense. Um, so that, that's debatable whether they really fired them. In fact, the, um, the Tobias Capwell, who's the curator of the Wallace Collection, he doesn't believe that. And he's pretty... Um, knowledgeable and, and when it comes to stuff like that so um as as great as those as 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 that looks in a mel gibson movie where the arrows just get fired in the air and then come crashing down um it's it's not very likely that it happened like that at least uh there's no record of that but go ahead uh greg I, I, yeah it's, well i guess it also depends on distance if it's a long distance maybe uh they did it like this but if it's a shorter Correct. distance Yes, uh, and and they they often uh, targeted uh, horses as well, uh, and um, so the uh, Genovese uh, cro crossbow uh, crossbow men. Well, yeah, clearly the French never developed the culture of longbow because that required the whole culture. You have to be uh, start training when you're a kid uh, in order to develop the strength uh, uh, to do this. So. Uh, French could never master this. It, it didn't become part of the culture. Maybe like uh, separate individuals could, but it was not common. So they couldn't counteract. Uh, so they hired a Genovese crossbow men uh, uh, as a mercenaries uh, to, uh, to kind of provide some kind of a level of artillery. Uh, but the French knight were very uh, obnoxious. They didn't respect them. As a matter of fact, in the Battle of Agincourt, famously, uh, they at some point uh, ordered the attack and they rode over uh, Genovese uh, crossbowmen uh, because uh, they were in front and they practically killed them, <laughs> their own crossbowmen, because of the disorganization. They were one of the things because they, there was a major attack uh, ordered. Uh, and, uh, it's actually kind of not even ordered. It started spontaneously. Uh, and uh, the crossbowmen uh, didn't have time to um, uh, get away. Uh, it, it's very interesting uh, what happened there. Uh, uh, as you know, there was plenty of movie about Henry V motivating his uh, uh, force. Uh, he had a, 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 he had no chance. Basically, uh, uh, they were completely exhausted. Uh, by trying to march away from a major, major French force that probably exceeded them by three or four times, uh, maybe even more uh, from what I remember. Uh, I think they only had uh, something around 10,000 and the French forces were like maybe 40, 50,000. Uh, and uh, the reason they managed to uh, win this war because uh, they needed... Um, um, they were up the hill and they wanted a French to attack them in order to exhaust. Uh, they also positioned the, uh, yeah, I see someone, uh, Kenny Brother, uh, made that movie. I've seen it, uh, a, a fantastic movie, uh, great character um, uh, based on Shakespeare. Uh, but uh, so, so they actually wanted French to attack, but they, they wouldn't attack. So they, because they prepared, they put the sticks in, uh, 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 you know, in order to stop the horses. Um, and they also positioned uh, the cross, uh, the uh, longbow men uh, on, on, on the flanks, uh, but the French wouldn't attack. So they had to move down in order for the crossbow men to reach 
uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the French army and they started killing them with, uh, uh, with, with longbows. And at that point, the French uh, started um, spontaneous attack. Nobody ordered it. And only half the army started it. And they uh, rode over the um, uh, um, allies, uh, the Genovese uh, crossbowmen, uh, and then eventually engaged only part of them. Uh, and they were, and that attack failed. They, they, there were a lot of uh, knights were killed, destroyed. Then the second wave had to get over bodies of those. They basically almost had a wall of bodies, and and eventually uh, the English prevailed in this uh, like uh, amazing uh, feat of armor. That's kind of a little story about this. <laughs> yeah, and that's where we could agree that the. English archer kind of made a name for himself, right? From there on. Yeah. Yes, be... yes, definitely. Yeah. And, and, and of course, no noble would ever uh, uh, handle the uh, longbow. It's, it was a, a, a peasant's uh, weapon. It was a lower class weapon, uh, but uh, they were very effective and uh, the English depended on them uh, and that gave them the whole advantage in the war. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. That definitely was a key, a key reason for their success. Um, so, so, uh, so Jay, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, it was was this the reason that English uh, warriors or English um, knights were used as mercenaries all over Europe um, previously and subsequently because of the fact they were extremely good with a you know bow and they also were considered to be you know, mercenary type, so like almost like a Swiss guard type of thing. Can you comment on that? Oh, sorry. Um, I think the, they were more Genovese uh, crossbow being employed than, the, the, to my knowledge, than the English longbow. I think the English bowman was a common um, soldier, and at least up until this point in, in England, they weren't, they, I don't think they had an idea of how effective they could be or how, uh, how, you know, deadly that weapon could be until after the hundred years war. That's my opinion. But as far as mercenaries, um, I think they, they came from all over. I think that, I mean, yes, you did have English ones, but you have uh, archers from, from different countries as well. I'm sure that the English ones were probably more, more desirable. Yeah. Also respect. another, qu another question, quick question. So yeah. the um, uh, the other word word for the crossbow was arbalet, right? Or that's something different. I'm sorry. What's the word? Arbalet. Um, hmm. I think it's the same thing. I think arbalet. it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I believe it is. Okay. Yeah. Groove is important. Yeah. Okay. Um. So um, let's go to the next slide. So this is just modern armor, what it looks like today by uh, historical reenactors and people that actually make and construct armor to, to, to the, the likeness of how it looked and felt. And, and, and as you can see, that it fits their body perfectly. It's made to uh, fit their, their, their torso, their legs, their arms, and so forth. And, um, and, you know, they have events a couple of times a year just to show people. Um, what what people wore in these battles and how it looked like and stuff like that. Um, so a uh, question we get a lot is what does these armors cost, right? Um, and that's really hard to say. It's like um, it all depends on what kind of armor you're trying to get, who's making it, and what's on it. Um, it's it's it it depends on the time as well. As I said earlier, um, in the later part of 15th century, it's not as expensive as it was in the 14th century, but still it was expensive. And, um, you know, it, it gets to a point where if you get it from a certain area, um, it could be very, very costly. For example, as I said, Milan and Oxford, Germany, or Nuremberg, Germany, were the who's who in armors uh, and armor making. And so much that they would actually have... They, well, they would put stamp and maker marks on the armor, um, but they would actually um, have people committing fraud in this, where they would buy cheaply made armor in other parts of Europe and then bring it there so they could get stamped and so they could get 
um, the, the, the profits for that, because like I said, that was a very profitable, or that was a very, um, sought after type of armor. And, um, um, you know, and so, as I said, uh, uh Italy and Germany were the best armor maker at the time. And there's actually an armor maker, uh, Henry the eighth, uh, establishes his own armor, um, making facility in Greenwich. Um, this is obviously much later in, in the 16th century. But needless to say, the best armor was coming from Milan and Nuremberg. And um, to put a price tag on it, it's just, it's really hard. I just thought I'd put, pull this out from the Met. This is from the Arms and Armor uh, curator, Dirk Breeden. And then right here, I think it, it says, um, the value of uh, armor ranged from low quality, outdated second hand. Wait, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. The, the entire armor of an English knight, the condes of which were valued in 1374 at over 16 pounds. This is the equivalent to about five to eight years of rent for a London merchant's house or over three years worth of wages for a skilled laborer. A single helmet, a bassinet, that's the helmet I just showed you earlier, probably uh, with an Amatel would be worth the purchase the price of a cow. I would think a cow in 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 those days because beef um, wasn't so so um, common for everybody. Um, so bottom line, armor was very very expensive. It's um it was something that took a long time um, to make. It had a lot of labor, had a lot of people working on it, and uh, if you could afford it, you could definitely um, you know. Um, you were somebody of nobility. And obviously that meant that if you were captured, as Greg explained, this meant um, this, it could save your life in, in more ways than one, right? If you had a good breastplate and you get a uh, shot with arrow, you will survive it or um, puncture with a blade, you will survive it. But if you're captured and you have nice accent marks or gilded with gold or silver, um, that's going to let your captor know that okay you you come from a you know a fat a well-to-do family uh so i can get money from you um so i'm gonna keep you alive uh so that that's something that will save your life right versus if you were just a nobody with just a, a simple um regular helmet and just regular body uh armor with like man, chain man or whatever they probably would would end your life right on the spot so um the better the armor um the better you would be uh, but obviously that will come with a lot of cost. Uh, Sergio, uh, there is a question here. Uh, what were the approximate, uh, approximate beginning and end dates for the use of the body armor? Uh, was it used through that, throughout the world? What is the beginning dates of body armor? <laughs> yes, a, a beginning and end. Um, it was uh, September 6th, uh, the year, I don't know, I'm just making up. <laughs> I mean, body armor, going back to, I, I believe, the like Greeks. The most used, ancient times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, used them, yeah. Yeah, the, the Greeks ancient definitely used of, bronze armor. They used right. uh, bronze armor that they, they um, either they, they uh, the helmets were made of one single piece of bronze that they would dish out. OK, um, and then the, the breastplates, the carasses, very likely they would have molded those. Um, but, you know, it varied from person to person. But, I mean, plate armor has been around. Again, I just want to cover the medieval period, because mainly in uh, Hundred Years' War. Um, but plate armor has been around for as long as war has been around, in my, my guess. And when I, did it I, end? I was I did, it didn't end. We still use casks, right? During the war, I mean, uh, during the war, uh, you wear uh, almost like some kind of helmet, right? From the, I was going to uh, say that, yes. Yes, right. uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, soldiers today wear helmets. So there, there even was... today, uh, even this war in Ukraine, <laughs> they wear it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how effective they are with, with bullets, but I mean, yes, there still is body protection, especially in the head, um, which has always been the, the most. Yeah. If important. it's not direct hit, it's probably effective. If it's, uh, you know, like an a, a angle, uh, you know, the bullet goes angled, probably the cast can save it. But uh, if it's a direct hit, then, then it won't. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that makes sense. Um, but overall, like as far as like plate armor and like what we see, I would say 16th century it starts to dim where we start seeing um, gunpowder and weapons of that sort come into the, the, the battlefield. So having this armor 
would not be effective. And being that it's so expensive to begin with, no one's going to invest in it anymore. So that's, that's when armor, again, the common armor, but to your point, yes, we still use it today in just a, a, a different yeah. way. Here is somebody pointing out bulletproof vests. We have that. That's the body armor, right? The right. police use it. They have, yeah. Kevlar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We still, yep. we, yeah, it still exists today. Um, so, um, and um, I there think- There is a question it. here also. I, I don't know if you could answer that. How much does the replica armor cost? Uh, oh, good question. Uh, yes, maybe. I can. Uh, oh, you can. Okay. And again, it it depends on um on who's making it for you and and what you're looking for. So there's um for people that want to do these historical reenactments or collect it, you could buy stuff from a regular website or on eBay, and they're made in India by manufacturers. And some of them are decent, some of them are okay. Uh, but if you want somebody. From Europe, there's a lot of armors that uh, make historically correct armor in, in, in countries like Poland and unfortunately Ukraine, who's going through some hard times right now. Um, they make some wonderful armor and the, um, those things, a helmet could be anywhere from $300 to $700 made to, your, made to fit your body. Um, and then again, the body, could go, it, could, it could go for a few hundreds to thousands of dollars. Um, the individual right here, his name is uh, Jeff Watson. He makes uh, he breaks armor here in the states, and he's one of the most um, prolific armor makers. He makes stuff for the the Metropolitan Art Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he, he does lectures and stuff like that. So um, yeah, armor could be expensive. I, I just you mentioned Poland. You know, I I actually I don't know over twenty years ago. I've been to Poland and uh, witnessed the reenactment of Grunwald uh, uh, battle, which is a battle uh, happened in 1410 yeah. uh, in uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth and uh, uh, Teutonic Knights. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were they use amazing uh, battle armor there. Uh, it's uh, with the horses. It it was a massive reenactment. I'm talking about. They probably have like maybe 200 men involved there on, wow. on both sides. Uh, wow. I couldn't believe it. Huge and right on the Grunwald uh, uh, fields. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've seen that. That that was uh, and it ended up with a lot of injuries, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I guess sure. they, they were drinking, uh, uh, you know, a lot. So oh. uh, and they started okay. real quarrel. So they started fighting for real. Uh, <laughs> So that that was pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm sure that must have been quite a sight. And they probably do it every year, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they do. They do. I just happened to be there at the time. Oh, okay. So you were just visiting and you found out about it and then you went? Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I knew about it. Yeah, I was visiting and uh, yeah, I went. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. Yeah, there's there they do historical reenactment stuff here, uh, but not to that scale. Like what you what you're describing sounds like something really out of, out of like a, a movie or something it, like extra. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, but yeah, that's um that's our presentation for today. Uh, if anybody had any questions or comments, um, uh, thank so, you. Yeah, Greg. this was a this was amazing presentation and. Uh, Again, with uh, quite a lot of exhibits and uh, good slides as well. Just wanted to mention um, before we ask any questions, Sergio actually, in combination with our history most ancient, is going is working on a date to organize a tour toward the Metropolitan Museum for the Arms and Armor exhibit. Uh, as you know, there is a special night exhibit, and um, not just a night exhibit. There is, you know. Uh, you have uh, Japanese armor exhibit. You have um, armor from Caucasus of uh, Russia. The armor from Tartar, and they call them, you know White Turks. Or, uh, so it's uh, there's a plenty of uh, things to see on that floor. I remember, I think it's a second or third floor uh, in Metropolitan Museum. But um, please stand by. You know, no, we'll uh, we'll coordinate with Sergio what day works for him, and then um, you know after that we can grab you know grab drinks or maybe uh, get a coffee and then we can discuss all, you know, what we've been uh, talked about today. And right. Greg, thank or, you for moderating. Go ahead. Or we can have our own reenactment in the middle of Fifth Avenue, you know, with sticks. Well, <laughs> yeah, we can, we can have that. But also Sergio had promised and uh, I promised him that, you know, I'm going to lose a little bit of weight and we're going to do Roman reenactment. I was going to mention that. Yes. 
Yes, go I'm, ahead. I'm go ahead. very excited about that. Um, now that the weather is getting nice, uh, I want to do a um, Life of a Soldier demo, which will showcase uh, what a soldier in the first, second century AD would have worn and what he carried, what his day-to-day -day life was. And, um, and that's um, something I'm really excited about and hope you guys join us because uh, we're going to have uh, Zach here dress up as a legionnaire uh, with the full armor and a helmet and uh, the equipment. And he's going to be marching 20 miles with his Kali guy sandals and it's going to be fun. So <laughs> stay tuned. We're, we're going to have a that, lot of fun that, with that one. That's correct. I think it, it should, it would be like 20 or more pounds on me, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's well distributed. So you, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. You know? Just, excellent, just excellent. Stick, stick with doing your, your 20 push ups a day, you'll be all right. You know? There you go. Okay, you go. Uh, anybody have questions? Put it in the chat, uh, I'll read them. Uh, well, oh. actually, I can also, if, if you guys are interested, I can unmute you if you want to orally ask questions. Just raise the hand, and either Greg, me, or Sergio will unmute you, and he can ask us a question. Uh, if you know, let us know. And then while we're talking about museums, uh, I don't know, Greg, if you know about the, the new exhibit that's on the um, uh, the New York Public Library called Treasures. And it's a small exhibit. And I don't know if it's a permanent one, but it's really, really special. They have um, original works from um, Shakespeare, um, Thomas Jefferson, um, you know, um, uh, uh, there's a letter from Columbus to one of his financiers, uh, Cortez. There's just a lot of relics uh, wow. from from people from history, um, playwrights. Yes. Yeah. So um, we should do a, a a group. I was telling Zach we should do a, um, like a group out. Yeah. Of I I I yeah, didn't sure. know about it. Yeah, I certainly would be interested. Uh, yeah. Someone is asking, will the Roman soldier reenactment be available online? <laughs> I don't know. Sergio, you're working on that, right? Also, or do you want well, to? Well, yeah. Well, are we going to live stream it? That's correct. We're going to so, Zoom live yeah, stream so... it and on YouTube channel. So stand by, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Sergio is going to, you know, obviously working on the, I think, light, you know, having the cameras around, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. It'll be uh, like a, like an afternoon on a Saturday or Sunday or something like that. And we'll just, I guess what, we, what we're doing now, but we'll just do it outdoors. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I was thinking, why not do it in, like in the cloisters, outside of cloisters? They won't allow it. So they, they have, we can break the camp there. And then uh, a lot of people can then go to the museum if they don't want to. And then, you know, there's probably restaurants and drinks and stuff. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, yeah, I, we'll I figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can do it in the park. I'm, I'm really. Look, people yeah. are saying fanta fantastic presentation. Thank you, Sergio. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um. All right. Well, then I guess that's that. Um. I thank everybody for joining us today. I appreciate it. Um. Hope you learned something. I hope. Uh, um. It was fun. Uh. It was definitely fun uh, to present tonight. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, everybody. Uh, Robert. Well, thank and, you. Um. Yeah. yeah. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. All, All right. right. Have a good night.